<laughs> yes, this is all about how um, how you remove yourself from California and the U.S. Hopefully, remove yourself from their corporate systems so that you can actually operate as a free citizen or a free national. And uh, some of the first things I learned were that uh, the Social Security card is a contract wherein you've created a contract with the government and um, it becomes kind of the first step. And somebody signs, checks a little box that says U.S. citizen and signs it claiming that you're a U.S. citizen, which would be somebody born in the district, born or naturalized in the District of Columbia rather than someone who was born in one of the several states of the Union. So the first thing I did was back in 2009 was return my social security number to the U.S. Treasury Department and notify the Internal Revenue Service as well and I think the Attorney General and Secretary of State of the U.S. Um, shortly after that I filed, uh, I started researching driver's licenses and who's required to have a driver's license and after a couple of years of research in 2012 I returned, uh, first I sent an inquiry to the California Department of Motor Vehicles to ask them if a state citizen was required to have a license. Prior to this I'd studied people like Paul Mitchell and Paul Hansen and Richard McDonald extensively as well as a few others to make sure that I understood who was required to have it and under what conditions they were required to have it. So I returned the license and I, I sent the license inquiry in March of 2012. They never responded. So on May 24th of 2012, I sent a letter to the director of the Department of Motor Vehicles of California returning my license, my license plates, and my registration with an explanation uh, based on California Vehicle Code and numerous U.S. Supreme Court and California Supreme Court cases and appellate court cases that uh, clearly indicated that the only people required to have the license were those who were operating in commerce which was defined as the transportation of passengers or property for hire or compensation within this state which is defined within this state was defined as the District of Columbia or uh, properties, lands, lands that were ceded to the United States and at um, California Commercial Code and Uniform Commercial Code 9307H the United States is, is clearly defined as being located in the District of Columbia. So I returned, I returned the licenses and all the materials and I got a letter back from the DMV claiming that uh, if I wanted to drive in the state of California I would be subject to the California Vehicle Code and that I was required to have a license registration and plates. Technically what they told me was 100% true. If I want to drive in the state of California, which is a political venue, not a physical location, then I would have to have all those items. Um, as I was not located within the state of California, political location, which is located in the United States in the District of Columbia, uh, I sent him back a letter, 20 page letter, addressing each item that he had in his letter, one by one, uh, with specific court cases that address the issue and specific sites from the vehicle code and California law. So after returning those things, about maybe two months after sending all these things off to the DMV, and they were copied to the California Separ Secretary of State Deborah Bowen for being recorded, and they were copied to Kamala Harris, who was the Attorney General of California, and they were copied to Governor Jerry Brown. So after sending all these off, about a month and a half later, I actually got stopped for no license plate. 
and the officer really didn't know what to do so he had to call his supervisor and his supervisor told him to write me the ticket so he wrote me a ticket for no license no license plates and he wrote up no insurance but at that time I still had insurance um, he never actually asked for the proof of insurance so I didn't give it to him I sent that letter back to the court uh, with a letter of explanation um, by special appearance only stating that I was um, appearing by special appearance without my permission and against uh, without my consent and against my will and I explained that I'm not a US citizen and I'm not subject to the codes and I sent copies of all the paperwork that I had sent to the state prior to that the letters to uh, George Valverde, Kamala Harris, and Secretary of State Bowen, as well as Governor Jerry Brown. I got a letter back from Sam, capital S, capital A, capital M, who says court clerk, whatever an SAM is, stating that I had to, still had to appear. So I sent Sam a letter stating that I'd be more than happy to appear, but my time is valuable and my fee is fifty thousand dollars an hour or any portion thereof for the first hour payable in advance and fifty thousand dollars an hour or any portion thereof for any additional hour and that will be billed upon my appearance and all they had to do was sign the contract and return it to me i got a letter back from sam stating again that i had to appear and so i returned to them a letter acknowledging their acceptance of the contract since they still demanded I appeared and telling them that they needed to make the advance payment prior to my November 30th date. I never received the advance payment so I didn't go. I did send them a letter afterwards telling them that uh, I didn't show up and why. Never re received a response. Then I didn't get stopped again until December of the same year and the officer actually took me out of my truck handcuffed me and put me in his car he ran the VIN number of my truck and um, I didn't give him a name but he badgered my wife who was a Japanese national didn't speak much English at the time he badgered her until she was crying to give him my name and my address so he ran it and then he came back and he told me I was going to have to sign a ticket. Interestingly enough, even though I had not appeared, it didn't show up on the record. There were no convictions and nothing appeared on the record. So he, he handcuffed me, put me in his car and badgered me until I told him, I, look, I'll sign the ticket. And I signed the ticket the same way as I did the first ticket, which is at arm's length, no contract. I didn't put my name. And then uh, he went on his merry way. That, that ticket got returned to the court in the same manner as the first ticket. And uh, I didn't get anything back from Sam with this one. I returned it with a letter similar and I got no response. I didn't hear from the court for another year and a half and late in 2013 I got stopped by an officer Edward F. Blanco in Guerneville, California and he actually towed my truck at that point the registration which I had returned a year and a half earlier had expired and so he actually towed my truck and left me my trailer. Um, I had to I had to re-register the truck, pay my ransom uh, to get my truck back, and um, I didn't pay any fees to the court. I just had to pay the ransom to get my truck back. And I sent the court letters, special appearance only, same as I had the first two tickets, and never heard from them again until the middle of 2014, I think it was, when they suspended my license or they claimed they suspended my license, which I had returned to them almost two years earlier. And when I got stopped in 2016, they uh, again demanded identification. 
I wanted to know what crime I had committed because I don't have to identify myself unless I've committed a crime according to the law. According to the officers, if I don't identify myself, I'm obstructing justice and so they arrest you for resisting arrest, which they did. And they put me in jail and they took my truck and my trailer and my dog and they basically kidnapped me and put me in jail. The officer, Edward S. Blanco again, uh, knew exactly what the story was. He'd been given this information before, Ad has his sergeant and the district attorney. They, uh, they got all of them, got all of this information in 2012 when they, oh sorry, in 2013 when they took my truck the first time. I provided all this uh, information and history for them the first time. They just ignored it. So this time they actually took me to jail and stole my dog, my truck, and my trailer and held me for ransom. So the, uh, once they had me in the jail, one of the things I didn't do was I never gave them my name, but they found a document in my truck that was, had the name redacted, but it was a copy of the original letter that was sent to George Valverde. So the officer, while he was in the process of arresting me, which took an hour and a half, two hours, well actually, they stopped me at 11.57 and we actually didn't leave that location until after three o'clock in Guerneville. So I was in his car for an hour and 45 minutes while he walked around holding the letter up to the sun, trying to see my name through the redaction. And I suggested to him, maybe you could just read the letter and see that I don't have a contract. But he said, I, I don't have time for that. I gotta find your name. So he did that until he got a portion of the name and then he actually had his sergeant go back to the CHP office in Rohnert Park and go look up the old record. And they were able to find it with a portion of my name. And um, In the interim, I had covered up and masked the VIN numbers that were on my car since according to the vehicle code, the VIN numbers are only required to be placed by the manufacturer. They're not required to be, to be left there the manufacturer has a requirement to place them for purposes of registration. I have no obligation to leave them and the, uh, the vehicle code only applies to vehicles engaged in transportation of passengers or property for higher compensation within this state in the first place. So it didn't apply to me. So there should have been no need. So. They arrested me and they held me in a waiting room and in the interim, uh, sheriffs kept talking to me. Now I had actually been stopped four separate times and three of those times I was issued citations. And three times I responded to the court with paperwork and sent additional paperwork directly to the judge, person to person. When they, after they arrested me, they put me in a holding cell and sheriff after sheriff kept talking to me, coming to talk to me to tell me, why don't I just sign paperwork and they'd let me go. Uh, which they're for, trying to compel you to, to contract with the, the jail. And in all cases, they kept telling me that my, um, when they'd pull up my sheet, it was clean, no convictions. So it showed that I'd been issued citations, but it showed no convictions, and they couldn't hold me or weren't holding me for not having appeared. The, that didn't occur until they tried to bully me in court. So um, when I went after two days, within 48 hours, they have to, they have to arraign you. Well, so it started at the beginning. When they arrest you, Sergeant, uh, or sorry, uh, Officer Edward F. Blanco put on his paperwork that he was arresting me uh, per California Vehicle Code 40302 A, I believe it is, wherein he has to take me before, if I don't sign a ticket, he has to take me before a magistrate immediately. And this is right in the Vehicle co Code 
as well as in the penal code, I believe at 849 and 872. Even though he put that in his report and was his justification for arresting me, he took me straight to booking. And they booked me, uh, even though I had demanded to be taken before a uh, uh, magistrate for examination, they didn't do that. And I was in there for 48 hours. No examination was ever held wherein they um, swore, where they issued a sworn statement that proved that the probable cause existed or the jurisdiction existed. They just kind of bypass this and bully you. So, uh, let's see, this was, I was arrested on February 15th, a Monday, and on Wednesday morning, they stretch it out about as long as they can, two hours before they would have run out of time, 48 hours, they took me to an arraignment. Uh, well, so, supposed to be an arraignment. I didn't know what it was, didn't have that knowledge. Anybody who's going to do this, it's not enough to understand what the law says or even who it applies to. You need to understand if things go wrong and the policy men or the court oversteps its bounds, you need to understand what to say, who to say it to, and how to handle it. It doesn't do any good to know the law if at the other end they're going to ignore the law or if by simply knowing the law you actually place yourself in a position of jeopardy because you say the wrong thing or fail to say the right thing in a courtroom once you're there. And there are ways to handle these things. Just, uh, I didn't know what they were. So when they took me to the arraignment, I, I know enough not to answer to the name. The name will be an all capital thing which they create. I knew enough not to do that. Uh, after the name was called once, uh, she called it, the judge called it a second time. This would be a judge, Shelley Averill. I don't even know if she's really a judge, but she wears a black robe. After the name was called a second time, the bailiff poked me and prodded me to respond. Without giving them a name, I told them that I was a flesh and blood living man, thereby special appearance only, against my will and, and without my consent to... Um, deny jurisdiction to the court and uh, Judge Shelley Avril promptly said uh, you're, my, stated that my objection was noted and that she assigned a public defender to me and I said I object I, I don't want a public defender or I'm sorry prior to this she asked me if I had representation and I said no and she said are you representing yourself and I said, no, I am presenting myself. And that's when she said, fine, your objection is noted, and she assigned a public defender. I objected. The public defender, they basically ignored me. The public defender immediately started a conversation with the judge from where she was, which was 20 feet away, too low for me to hear. And after having gotten the... Um, the court minutes, I found out that what the public defender did was immediately waive all my rights, waive my right to hear the charges, waive time. She basically waived everything and stipulated to the arraignment, which didn't really occur because there hadn't been any examination, there had been no establishment of probable cause. When I asked if I could say something, I was told no by the public defender. This was C. Brady. And so I asked the judge directly if I could say something and C. Brady actually yelled at me, shut up! Don't say anything, shut up! And I was escorted out of the courtroom. So apparently if you take a public defender or if you have representation, you are no longer capable of rep of speaking for yourself. You become a ward of the court, which is basically someone who is incapable of speaking for themselves or taking responsibility for themselves. You're not allowed to talk. You're not allowed to put in paperwork. Let's see, they, they put me back in my cell 
And then the sheriffs kept coming back in and trying to talk me into just signing paperwork and they'd release me. And I refused to sign paperwork. I found out about 9.30 at night on Wednesday that I had actually, uh, that they had actually posted bail. No one had told me about this. Oh, sorry, that bail had actually been set uh, and they'd never told me about it. And about an hour after I found out bail had been set, uh, they came and told me that my wife was actually posting bail. Um, my, my guess is that they weren't going to tell me about bail, except that my wife's friend called the court and asked about it. Uh, so I guess they found, they must have decided they were gonna have to tell me about it. Um, so I was released around midnight on February 17th and on uh, see they had set they gave me two court dates uh, March 8th and March 10th 8th for a pretrial conference and March 10th for the trial itself and I filed as soon as I was out I started doing research on what I could do to stop this before it went any further and I ended up using Mark Stevens paperwork uh, and I filed ended up filing a demure motion to dismiss a notice of judicial or sorry a request for judicial notice a request for discovery which I Brady believe is a Brady Brady motion I filed those three documents on March 4th and the clerk received them. I hand delivered them to the district attorney and copied them by mail to the officer Edward F. Blanco and uh, hand delivered it to the clerk in the court. The, when I got to the hearing on March 8th, one of the first questions I asked was if the judge had gotten the paperwork and she said she had but it was on her desk and she hadn't read it so I'm not quite sure why a, why a judge would elect to ignore it but one of the things that occurred was that uh, C. Brady, the public defender was jumping up and down and yelling at me that I couldn't submit paperwork that she would decide what paperwork was submitted, who would be submitted to, when it would be submitted, and that I had no right to do anything. The, um, the judge then asked me, I, I, and I objected to the public defender again. Again, first words out of my mouth were that I was there by special appearance only, uh, against my will and without my consent to challenge jurisdiction. At this point, I was outside of the bar. Uh, one of the things I've learned is stay outside of the bar. Uh, if you are outside of the bar, in theory, I've been told that the judge can only speak to you man to man, that you are not uh, a person in a legal sense. So the, um, the, the judge started talking about pre-trial pre motions and I had objected to the public defender. So she asked me if I was gonna represent myself again and I said no, I would be presenting myself, I would be appearing in pro per. Oh, sorry, at this point, I told her I'd be applying in propria persona. She said I didn't have that choice, I didn't have that option and that I had to fill out a form, a Feretta form in which you have to ask the court for the court's permission to represent yourself or yeah to represent yourself if you're not being represented and I asked her asked the judge if I could take it home with me and research it she said fine so that terminated that that day um, I immediately because the judge had ignored my paperwork, Mark Stevens' instructions were to file a motion in limine, which I did that afternoon. And then I also went home and researched 
impropria persona, improper versus uh, impro se, and found out that impro se is no different than being represented. You're still purported to represent yourself, which would suggest that you're the defendant. Impropria persona means that you're appearing in your in just you, that uh, you're not a, you're not there representing anybody. Um, so when I went in on Thursday morning, which had been March 10th, I again, same spiel, that I was there by special appearance only to, without my consent and against my will, to deny jurisdiction. And again, I asked, which I had done previously, I asked for whatever facts the district attorney had showing that the codes and statutes applied to me. I'd actually done this each and every time and she always told me that uh, she had already made the determination that jurisdiction existed and that the district attorney did not have to provide the, that information. And I asked for the information, was again told that he didn't have to provide it and if I asked again that I would be um, hit with contempt of court. So, um... Then they refused to give you a sworn complaint? Yeah, I asked, uh, I asked, in addition, I asked the district attorney, or I asked the judge for a copy of a sworn complaint. The judge asked me to enter a plea, and I told the judge that I can't enter a plea until I see what I'm pleading to, so I demanded a sworn complaint, a valid sworn complaint. And uh, the judge informed me that she didn't have to provide that. And I told her, well, I can't plea in, unless I see what I'm pleading to. So she elected to enter a pleas for me. At, at this point, um, they informed me that they were gonna, uh, that there would be a an amended complaint. They were adding a gun charge. They broke into a safe that was in my truck, a locked, secured safe, and it was verified locked and secured no less than eight times by the CHP who arrested me, four times in writing and four times verbally on the recording that they provided. Um, so they, they claimed they were gonna add a gun charge on there and that became their number one charge. But when she, uh, she claimed that they filed it, they filed the complaint, and yet when, now she had already, this is the first time she entered pleas for, oh no, she entered pleas on the 17th. On the 17th of February, uh, the public defender entered pleas of not guilty to the five charges. Um, and again, this was a private conversation between her and the judge, so I never heard this. I didn't, I wasn't aware of this at this point. Uh, I got a court docket afterwards at the suggestion of Paul Hansen and uh, Andy Jackson, and I saw on there that the pleas had been entered and that I had, all the white rights had been waived. So on the March 10th, um, she again asked me to enter a pleas. So, yeah, if, second, if, arraignment. second arraignment, yeah, if in fact the first arraignment was in fact a valid arraignment, there would have been no reason to ask me to enter pleas again. But she was asking me to enter pleas again, which would suggest that the first arraignment was a sham. Um, and again, after telling her that I can't enter an arraignment and I can't enter a plea until I know what I'm pleading to, she elected to enter over my objections pleas for me again not guilty to the five original charges she did not plead to the sixth charge that she claimed she had filed prior to this plea she on the court docket it shows that the amended complaint was filed but afterwards she pled to the five original charges again not guilty so there was no evidence that anything was amended because the five charges were the same. Correct. Yeah, there was. Just repeat um, it so that it the it the fact that the original five charges were all she pled to would suggest that there was no amended complaint, even though she claimed that she filed it, and the court docket 
states that they filed it, and yet when it came to actually doing the plea, she only pled to the five original charges. Um, at the at the beginning of this session on the tenth tenth of March, <clears throat> uh, I, I on on the eighth I filed a motion in limine because she ignored my original three uh, submissions, and I believe the motion in limine requires her to look at the original three submissions. She never ruled on the three; she hadn't read them. Um, the very first thing the the public defender did after I made my opening statements that I'm um, there by special appearance only was she started yelling at me and telling me again that I could not submit paperwork that she was representing me and I told her I'm not, you're not representing me and I'm filing the paperwork so she asked the judge for a moment and she drug me out in the hallway and started actually yelling at me that I can't submit paperwork and that she would again, she would decide what we submitted, when we submitted it, who we submitted it to, and that I had no say and I couldn't speak and I can't submit paperwork. When she, when she was yelling at me that I can't submit paperwork, she proceeded to yell at me and tell me that if I wanted to drive in the state of California, I was gonna have to get a license a driver's license, put license plates on my car, and register my vehicles. And she was yelling at me in the hallway at the court about this. So I asked her if I am presumed innocent until proven guilty, and she said, of course. And I asked her, why are you yelling at me that I'm already guilty if in fact you're supposed to be presuming that I'm innocent? So I asked her to sign a contract that would guarantee that she would protect my rights and that she would support my position and do what I requested. And she said, she's absolutely not signing any contracts with me. So there's a little more of your proof that they already have a contract with the court and they work, excuse me, for the court. They don't work for you. They work for the court and their first responsibility is to the court is to get you to take a deal so that they can just shuffle you through like a checkout line in Costco. And that's exactly how, if you just stand and watch it in court, that's exactly how it works, is they trump up a charge against you and add a whole bunch of stuff to it that doesn't apply and they can't prove, and they have no valid charges even filed against you. And they make it seem insurmountable, then you take a deal because your representative, be it a lawyer, or the public defender sells you down the drain and then then they make up the charges against you based on what you're willing to accept and contract and if you accept nothing and don't contract there are no valid charges they can't make them because they don't exist so after we went back in from the hallway then C. Brady the public defender was relieved by the judge by Shelley Avril I don't know if she's a judge she was relieved of her duty by Shelley Avril, and the record thereafter shows that I was appearing in pro per. But I had to fight for it. They kept telling me I didn't have that option. You can't do that. And they didn't start trial on 310 either. That's true. Um, fortunately for me, Andy Jackson was, uh, he showed me, uh, I believe it's a 1789 constitution that guarantees that you have the right of representation by an attorney or yourself or assistance of counsel and it clarifies that you have assistance of counsel and it doesn't have to be an attorney or a lawyer uh, it can be someone like Andy Jackson or anyone who's knowledgeable there's, there's nothing in the law that requires that you be represented or represent yourself you can appear in pro per so, and fortunately for me, that was pointed out to me by Andy Jackson. I was able to research it, and the court record subsequently showed that I was appearing in pro per. So, um, let's see. She said, she, I, the, the judge then set 
the um, reset the trial date. Sorry, she reset the pre-trial conference for April 17th and reset the trial for April 19th. No, April 19th, and they preset the trial for April 21. Um, they asked me if um, they gave me uh, the when they relieved C. Brady of her duty. They were required to. She handed me all of her discovery, which was nothing more than the original fake five charges, unsigned. And when the district attorney handed me his discovery, it was nothing more than the original five charges. Um, oh, I'm sorry. His copy had a signature on it, Malfetti, Emily Malfetti. Find it. Malfetti is the assistant DA who is not a witness to the alleged crime or the, the situation, not a first-hand witness. They have no legal authority to sign the paperwork filing the claim, and there was no sworn affidavit uh, done by the officer in front of an examining judge. There was no paperwork at all, no examination, no establishment of probable cause. There was no established, nothing to establish jurisdiction other than the Shelley Avril claiming because she said so. And when I was given discovery from the assistant district attorney, they had no establishment or proof of any of that. There was no arrest warrant issued based on probable cause. Uh, they had nothing. They had only their claim, the same claim. And I got the same thing from both the uh, C. Brady public defender and the uh, deputy district attorney. So the, the judge asked me, she wanted to set the trial for the following week, and she asked me if I needed more time, and I said it would be helpful. And, and she, she, said, she mentioned, are you asking me to set your trial later? And I said, no, I'm just saying more time would be helpful. And she asked me again, are you asking me to set your trial for this date or that date? And I said, no. I'm not asking you to do anything. I am not going to contract with this court. So she set the trial, she set the dates herself at the 19th and the 21st. She, once she set the dates, she stated that I could plea at that time. Well, actually, she did that on the 19th. Okay. Because the trial was set for the 21st. On the 19th, we had a, a readiness conference again. In the interim, after the, the, in the, after the March 10th, hearing um, we uh, with with Andy Jackson's assistance we we started submitting paperwork that um, challenged the court's jurisdiction and challenges their challenged their position that I was a US citizen that I was subject to the the um, codes or statutes or that the Constitution even applied to me um, and we submitted facts we submitted the information concerning my having returned my license and the plates and the registration in 2012 and the recorded documents showing that. We submitted documents, a writ of habeas corpus, which basically requires that they show proof that they have a reason for holding you. They ignored all of our paperwork, answered nothing. We submitted... A counterclaim. Hmm? Six, I, I actually submitted there were seven submissions between the 10th. March 10th. There were four prior to March 10th. There were seven between March 10th and April 19th. And on April 19th, when we went into court, uh, I asked her again, after my usual spiel, I'm here by special appearance only, without my consent, against my will, to deny jurisdiction. And again, I was threatened with 35 days in jail for contempt if I brought it up again. I think I brought it up twice. And apparently if you bring something up three times, they're compelled to respond to it. After the second time, she threatened me with 35 days in jail for contempt if I brought it up again. I probably should have brought it up again in retrospect. But After the hearings on March 10th, at Andy Jackson's um, suggestion, on March 14th, I went to the court clerk and I asked to view the files, all the files that were available on, on this case. 
and we took two cell phones. We used one cell phone to film, place it on the desk with the date clearly available, and then we used the other cell phone to document what files were in the, the, the court case, in the court file. And so we took, we verified that there was never a warrant, an arrest warrant issued, which is required under the law, if the courts operate under the Constitution, and if they operate under common law as they claim to, or as the law claims they are supposed to, then there would, they would have had to obtain an arrest warrant. They would have also have had to obtain a valid search warrant for my truck the day after the truck was taken. None of those existed. And again, the only documents that showed in there were the original complaint with the five items on it and my four filings. And that was the only thing that was in the record. That was the entire record. So we have video copy of that showing that there was nothing else there. There was no valid search warrant. There was no um, sworn documents from the officer, the CHP, or any other officer. No sworn documents from anybody. Right. Uh, yeah, there, there were no documents from anyone saying that they witnessed a crime. No sworn statements, no... Um, I think the, the Constitution requires... A, California Constitution, both 1849 and 1879, it's Section 1, sorry, Article 1, Section 19, require that in order to arrest someone or take their property, uh, there must be a sworn affidavit um, that a crime has been committed. And that was never done. It was never, they never provided any kind of sworn statement. It's all, everything's based on because I said so, and because you don't know the law and you don't know what to do about it. On April 19th, uh, after giving my usual spiel, entering the court and being told that she had already determined jurisdiction existed, I asked her if she had received the documents that I filed. And she claimed, yes, she had filed, uh, she had received the documents. I actually filed seven of which she, I actually filed seven documents, including a habeas corpus, a declaration of facts, a request for abatement. Um, I don't remember what they all were, but... Counterclaim. Which one? Counterclaim. Ah, counterclaim. I submitted a an affidavit in support of a counterclaim for the damages up to that point and anticipated through the trial date, which would be two days later. And uh, on the 19th, she stated that she had received the documents, but that they were inapplicable and in, inadmissible, that she couldn't enter them into the file because they didn't apply. Now this is, it was her story while we were in court. So then she proceeded to do her um, pre-trial conference, which is to tell me what would occur in the jury trial and tell me that I could not bring up jurisdiction, I couldn't bring up the law, I couldn't bring up any of the paperwork I'd done before, I couldn't bring up court cases, I couldn't bring up anything except the charges themselves. So I was I was not allowed, according to her, to, now you need to know, she has lied to me all the way through this. Multiple times prior to this, I had asked her about it being a court of record. And because under the 1879 and the 1849 constitutions, every court in California is required to be a court of record, which means that there's a recording, a transcript. And there's a little counter that sits on her desk. And in theory, when that little counter is going, you can see the numbers going, there's a record being created. Well, that had never been going prior to that. And I brought this up. And she told me it was a, it is a court of record. And I mentioned to her that none of, nothing, none of my objections, nothing I'd ever said had been, was, was on the court record. And she said, well, it's a court of record, it's all there. So she actually reached over for a few moments, showed me how it worked, and then we proceeded. She told me about all the things I couldn't say and gave me the instructions, the jury instructions, and we're, 
basically I couldn't tell the jury anything except um, that there were charges against me. I wasn't allowed to defend myself in any way or fashion according to Shelley Avril. So it was pretty clear at this point that this was nothing more than a railroad job. If I can't defend myself, I can't bring up anything that is a defense, um, a valid defense, not allowed to bring that up, can't bring up the fact that there is no jurisdiction, that there was no examination, there was no probable cause, none of these things had ever been established, that the DA never provided one single fact. As a matter of fact, to this point, the DA had never said one single word all interaction was with the judge and she was prosecuting from the bench. She wasn't even interacting with the DA. Any question I brought up about things the DA was doing, she answered directly, not even answering whatever the DA was doing. She made those determinations and decisions. The DA said nothing, sat there like a rock the entire time. So uh, at the end of that day, it was obvious that this was nothing more than a railroad job. Uh, I, made the I made the determination that this was nothing more than a kangaroo court and there was no way to defend myself. So the, we made the decision to file a writ of prohibition with the court in San Francisco, uh, with the appellate court in San Francisco. So uh, we went home and between Andy Jackson and myself we did a, a writ of prohibition which on the 21st when I was supposed to be doing the trial we, I mailed off to the appellate court in San Francisco and I didn't submit the, I should have submitted, I should have submitted the copy to the court on that date, on the trial date, before the trial time, mistake I made, and I didn't because it's a special appearance, it's, it's by law, it's an appearance. Um, I didn't file it until the following morning, Friday, my mistake. Uh, but I did file, the, we did mail it off and I have the receipt and all the information from mailing this stuff off to the uh, appellate court in San Francisco. Uh, when I didn't show up in court, it was kangaroo court, and I had, and I actually had never agreed to any of this in the first place. I told her constantly I wasn't going to contract with her. So when I didn't show up, she issued a warrant for my arrest for $100,000. There are people in there who had murdered people who had warrants for 50000 And I don't have license plates and I got a warrant for 100000 So I guess I should have been proud. She was pretty pissed off. So over the weekend, we did more paper. I did more paperwork to submit, which uh, probably would have got submitted the following week. But on Monday evening, seven sheriffs showed up at my house SWAT style looked like something off TV and I was re-arrested and taken back to the court and rebooked, entirely rebooked again, the whole process all over again. And uh, this time, uh, the first time they had me in there, they kept me away from the general population. Let's see, so they arrested me on Monday evening and they didn't do, they did another arraignment on, uh, I believe this was on Wednesday morning. Again, they stretched it out 48 hours as long as they could. And uh, Wednesday they did an arraignment again and set a trial date. Now the original trial date was set pretty quick. They were in a hurry. I think I had four days or something like that before she was shoving the trial down my throat. And this time, she set the trial date. And again, I told her I was not going to contract with her. This time, they set the trial date out almost 30 days. She got as close to the 30 days as she could. And if they don't have the trial within 30 days, then they have to turn you loose. So she set it as close as she could get it. And uh, so for, um, they posted the bail, they set bail at 100,000. I wasn't going to post that. I wasn't going to give them any more money. Uh, so they put me in the male adult detention center, which is downtown Santa Rosa, until Friday morning. The first time I was in jail, they did not let me out with the general population. They kept me away because I was talking to people about the law and how it works. This time they actually let me out in the general population. Um, 
and they kept me there until Friday morning, which was Cinco de Mayo, the Friday morning of Cinco de Mayo. And I think they were expecting a large influx of customers, new customers, over the, the weekend from Cinco de Mayo. So they moved me to the North County Detention Center, which has a bit more freedom. You still don't have the ability to do any paperwork. You don't have, once you're in there, you have no access to a law library. They, they will let you access a court case. If you know the court case, the court numbers, the court dates and everything else, you can write that down and request it. And they might give it to you. If you don't know all those things, you're gonna get nothing. Um, I put in requests for uh, the docket and they didn't wanna give me the docket. I put in a request three times for um, transcripts and they never responded to my request for transcripts. I put in requests multiple times, three times, for a copy of the CHP report that supposedly, allegedly, all of this was based on. After three requests and about two weeks, they finally said, well, we don't have that, and if you want it, you have to get it from the CHP. Which was interesting in as much as Shelley Avril claimed that um, when I had asked for a valid charging instrument based on an examination, she claimed that they had already performed an examination based on a sworn statement by CHP officer Edward S. F. Blanco, even though there was no sworn statement of any kind in the record. And if the court didn't have a copy of a sworn statement from the officer, how could they have an examination or make a determination based on that sworn statement that didn't exist? And uh, there was no sworn or signed statements from Edward F. Blanco or any other CHP officer. Officer David Spencer is the one that broke into my safe or allowed my safe and my truck to be broken into by accidental towing. He did not have a signed statement. They simply have a typewritten statement and then some other officer signs it as having reviewed it, but no one signs a statement. So there's no actual verified evidence that someone's willing to take responsibility for. It doesn't exist. It didn't exist in the records. Uh, Andy Jackson pulled records at one point, still wasn't there. Uh, he got copies of the docket. There was nothing showing any sworn statements from the CHP officers or anyone else being entered into the files or record. After the... They, they just, just tell them that it was interesting afterwards that they did enter the, the file. On the 17th, when you complained about your seven copies not being entered, apparently the same day they entered them all. So just yes. on on April on April 19th, um, after I asked Shelley Avril if if she had received my copies, and she said yes. She told me they were inapplicable. They were inadmissible. They 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 couldn't be entered into the record because they didn't belong there. After all of her BS, um, after I was removed from the court, she actually filed all the documents except one. They She didn't file a declaration of facts, and you'll probably see that at some point on this site. That declaration of facts is the one that had the proof that all my paperwork had been returned to the DMV, had copies of the DMV response refusing to follow their own law, and had copies of subsequent letters that were uh, sent to the DMV verifying that they were, they were blatantly going to ignore their own laws. So uh, she did not enter that, and there was documented proof that I am not a U.S. citizen and never have been. Um, she refused to enter that into the, the, the file. Later on, on May 17th, I again asked her about that document specifically, and she specifically said that it was inapplicable and couldn't be entered. That document never was entered in because had they accepted that document, it was like the habeas corpus, they, they couldn't 
continue forward with what they were attempting to do, which is basically bluff me. So uh, between after after April 25, when they rearrested me and they moved me to the uh, North County Detention Center, Andy Jackson again did submitted more paperwork. We did. Uh, I don't remember what the exact documents well, the first were. One the first the one or two. Oh, uh, Andy, Andy filed a judicial performance complaint based on Shelley's actions and what she was saying on April 19th and her subsequent 21st issuance of the uh, $100,000 warrant for my arrest. And um, we, uh, Andy wrote up a um, motion to quash. Uh, we submitted one or two other documents in between there, but he submitted a motion to quash, uh, actually came to the, the, the North County Detention Center so I could sign it, and then he submitted that. They pretty much ignored it. They never did enter that into the record. They never filed that one. Yeah, they did. They did? I think so. Maybe not. I can't the remember. He asked her in court if she was going to force the DA. I, in, in, on, the, on April 19th, I requested that she require the DA to respond to the motion to quash item by item, which they're required to do by law, if they're following the Constitution and their own laws. She said that she doesn't have to do that and she was not going to require the DA to do that. So obviously she's telling us that she's following some other law other than the one they lead us to believe they're following. When you submit a motion, the opposition, all of these papers I, that, that Andy and I had submitted had been submitted to the DA, and at this point we were up to about 14 or 15 documents, 16 documents. They were, su they were submitted to the district attorney personally and then walked downstairs to the court clerk. The district attorney is required to respond if he has a response, and if he doesn't have a response, if it remains unrebutted or uncontroverted, then it becomes the truth. It becomes law, basically. So the district attorney never responded to one single paper we submitted. All right, on May 17th, when I asked the Shelley Avril to require the district attorney to respond to the motion to quash, her response was that she did not have to, she was not going to require him to respond to anything and that he didn't have to. Which is interesting because by the laws that were led to believe that they're following, he would have been required to. No, he's not required to, but she has to then, well, she has to uh, rule in true. favor of your motion if there's no opposition. So, ah. You see, she's not required to order him to do it, but then she, what she is required to do is rule in favor of you being that there's no opposition. Otherwise, she's prejudiced by she's going to oppose your motion. So what I should have done with all of these motions, and I never did, was once I verified the fact that she had them, I should have asked her to rule on them, and I didn't. If, if when I submit a motion, if the district attorney does not respond to it or rebut it, then the motion should be granted. And the mis one of the mistakes I made was not making sure requesting of her specifically or ordering her specifically to grant the motion. Grant it or deny it, one of the two. I don't know that she, she has the authority she to deny, deny it on her own. She, yeah, she can't deny it if there's no opposition. I mean, what base, it's an adversary position. It's you against the DA. It's not you against Supposed the DA. Supposed to be. So, you, so, so you, she, she can't force the DA to do anything, except that if you're not going to do anything, then I'm going to rule in favor of it, and, and your whole case goes bye-bye. Then she'd be acting like a judge. Can't have that. See, so, so that's <laughs> so. My error was in not ensuring that since the district attorney provided no opposition to any of my motions, and again, you need to understand these things before you take any of these steps. It's not enough to know the law that applies to your license plate or your driver's license or insurance or whatever it is you're doing. It's not enough to know the law. You need to understand how the court works. And if you submit a motion, that if that motion is not rebutted or there's no response to it, then essentially the judge has to allow that 
motion and you need to ask her to do it ask them to do it if you don't ask it appears they won't do it so the motion is filed but it's never ruled on and had I known enough to make sure that occurred things probably would have gone a lot different they probably would have kicked me out a lot sooner not knowing this um, this cost me a lot of time I spent a lot of time under their control because I didn't know enough to demand from the very beginning that if there was no response to my demurrer that she rule on it and had she ruled on it in the beginning allowed it I would have never this would have been over in two or three days failure on my part you need to understand all these parts really well before you do this it wouldn't have been over in two or three days the fact is is that after going to court you you seen a whole new side of the court and that now you understand that it's just a corrupt criminal operation it and they don't follow any law that's the real issue well it, had it, i you can bring up the fact that once you present a demur in court it has to be answered in court at that time and they the judge can give them a waiver of i'm going to give you three days to answer it but if you don't answer it that's it but i didn't ask for it because i didn't i assumed I made the mistake of assuming that the judge would make sure that a demurrer got responded to or that a ju notice or judicial request got responded to. Mistake I made was assuming, cannot assume that. You have to ask for it. If you don't ask for it, the judge won't do it, whether it's a responsibility or not. I didn't know enough to ask for a ruling on the demurrer or the notice for judicial or the uh, request for judicial notice or the Brady request. They acknowledged that they had been filed, including the district attorney, when on April 19th, when I asked if, the, if uh, the judge had received the paperwork we'd filed, which at that point was seven documents. Uh, she acknowledged that she had received it, she also told me that they were inapplicable, uh, that they couldn't be admitted, blah, blah, blah. Had uh, th the district attorney at that point noted to the judge that I had submitted a habeas corpus. And they're required to respond to that fairly quickly, uh, within three days or something of that nature, unless you're in a prison, you've already been sentenced, and then they don't have to respond for 60 days. But they never responded to that until um, two weeks after they compelled me to contract with them, accept a deal. So you have to make sure you ask for it. You have to make sure that, don't assume that they're gonna do anything. You can assume that it is exactly what it is, which is a very, very corrupt system, and they are not gonna do anything you don't request. The judge will do, she, be 100% zero neutral. She'll do nothing unless you force her to do it. So if you submit a motion, you have to ask for a ruling and not leave there or be satisfied until you get that ruling. Mistake I made. I never asked her to rule on a single thing and she never did. And nothing got ruled on except for the habeas corpus and that was two weeks after the whole thing was over. And then they didn't answer it. And they then they didn't they respond to it. They just they denied it because it was over. And you weren't um, at at this point, or slightly before this point, uh, this is partially what precipitated the notice of judicial complaint, the the criminal complaint, was that the writ of prohibition that was written to the district court appellate court. The, they denied the writ of prohibition, so they were going to allow the court to just go ahead with their what they were doing, which was not following a law, violating their own laws. And they didn't give, I believe they're required to give a reason for a denial. They didn't do that. They simply said denied. And uh, they ignored they ignored their own law just as much as the court here. So the corruption isn't doesn't stop at this level. It's not going to stop at the cop or the sheriff's department, Steve Frieda's sheriff's department. They know they have to do an examination. They know it's required by law. They won't do it. Even if you ask for it, they don't do it. They'll do the arraignment without ever having held a fake arraignment, without ever having held the examination, and they'll hope you don't know the difference, which if you have a, a public defender, you don't know the difference. 
So your public defender will sell you down the tube, stipulate to the arraignment without examination, without establishment of probable cause or jurisdiction, and then you're just taking a deal. So it becomes a matter of how much is it going to cost you, and do you have to do jail time or is it just monetary? And then of course there's your record and they'll make sure that they have you on probation so that they can again haul you in any time they want for any reason they want just because they can and extort more money from you. So there's lots of reasons to learn how to so stop the this in the, the beginning. last day that trial was going to be happening, Shelley had a complete chain makeover. So um, two things occurred on the 19th. Um, the uh, we again had a pretrial conference where she again reinforced that um, I couldn't submit any paperwork and oh I asked I asked Shelley about my declaration of facts why it was not entered into the record and she told me again it was inapplicable it uh, it didn't apply and I asked her point blank do you have to follow the higher court decisions and she said well of course I do I said well all the court higher court decisions are in that paperwork 